All right, folks, let's do this. The house lights come up and I see an audience in front of me. Isn't this just brilliant? We're back in real life. I mean, let's hear it for the vaccine. I mean, come on, this is great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love this. I, I, this is, I've, I've not seen a, a real-life audience for two years, you know, so, so be kind, I think is what I'm saying. It's, it's just lovely to see you here. Um, and it's such a gorgeous sunny day today. We thought, oh, no one's going to come in out of the sun and, and sit. But you, here, here you are, proving me wrong. Wonderful. Um, so so look, we're, we're going to jump into it quite soon. I've got some housekeeping stuff to tell you. I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm your friendly host for the next hour. My name is Gareth Mitchell, and I'm at Imperial College, just next door, as a science communication tutor. And I also work at the BBC on BBC Science Radio, where I'm one of the presenters and I've been doing it a long time, and I do a weekly technology programme on the BBC World Service. So I'm not used to seeing my audience, <laughs> you know, so here we are. Um, but enough about me. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, human health and planetary health. Can, can we eat the planet greener is my slightly, um, slightly weird way of, of framing the opening question. But that's the thing, you know, changing diets. We're hearing so much now, obviously, about the carbon footprint of the, the food that we eat in terms of the growing, the, um, the transport and the consumption and the recycling of packaging and so on. It's a really big issue. And we'll hear from the panel just how big an issue, how much a bigger contribution um, food production and consumption makes to carbon emissions. So that really is, does, you know, does a healthy diet mean a healthy planet? That's what we're going to be discussing over the next hour. Um, just to take us there, a little bit of um, COVID housekeeping. I'm delighted to see most of you have kept your face coverings on and we'd like you to keep those face masks on. I know that we're not wearing them, but we are, um, for one thing, we're not facing it, each other up here on the panel. For another thing, we're quite a long way from you, importantly, and um, we're one metre spaced from each other. So we're following all the, the guidance here. But if you're thinking, well, hang on, they've taken their face coverings off. Um, we have the one in the green room. We're going to put them off on again as soon as we go off stage. But we're within the guidelines to keep ours off but we do need yours because you're sitting closer together. We need you to keep yours on. So appreciate that. And I, 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 you know, it's a shame that we have to, but hey, we're still in the pandemic, aren't we? Uh, so thanks for, um, for going with that. Um, also, as we go along, I want this to be an interactive panel because I might run out of questions, frankly. Uh, so well, then what are we going to do? It's going to be a long hour, isn't it? So I need some questions from you and you watching at home as well. A warm welcome to those of you watching on the, the web stream as well. It's really nice to have you here joining us. So we're doing hybrid. How cool is that? We have people at home too. So hello to them, hello to you watching at home. Those of you here in the audience, if you want to pose a question, we have a microphone right here at the, at the front, so you will come up here and pose your question and then, then uh, return to your seat. Um, at home, you have direct access to me via this iPad. Um, so anything you write into the chat turns up on here. I think it is moderated, so if you say something nasty or rude, I won't see it, but other than that, I will. So you've kind of got an advantage if you're at home, you're kind of right here on the desk in front of me. Um, so I want interaction both from our home audience, and I'll try not to trash the iPad, and uh, from you. What else should I tell you? I think that's about it, isn't it, really? Apart from just to remind you, this is the Great Exhibition Road Festival. I'm staying on brand with my badge there. Um, so it's the best part of a week of uh, talks, discussions, demonstrations, and science-related, cultural design-related fun stuff along this uh, wonderful part of London, uh, along the Great Exhibition Road. And of course, we're here at the Royal Geographical Society, but the museums are taking part, Imperial College next door. So don't just come to this thing, make the most of it. There's loads of other events on, so you can check them out on our website. It's a really long URL, but it's very easy to remember. Great exhibitionroadfestival.co.uk um, but you've probably seen the website already because that's how you found out about this but it's worth reminding you isn't it so yeah just keep supporting the festival we need you to come and keep this event going so um, that's about it enough from me let's meet the panel and um, on the stage we have um, Neil Brummett Dr Neil Brummett is a senior researcher with the Natural History Museum's Algae, Fungi and Plants Division um, and um, uh, I gather your father was a botanist, Neil. Yeah, yes, that's right. My father spent almost his entire career, more or less, working at Kew Gardens. 
Right. And you're a keen gardener yourself. Yes, very much so. Right. Yes. You, you qualify both academically, research-wise, and indeed um, pastime-wise to be here, and in terms of your genealogy as well. It's, it's just all in place for you, Neil. No worries <laughs> at all. So we're really glad Neil's here as well. Let's go to uh, Paolo, who's online. Um, Paolo, Professor Paolo Vines, thanks very much indeed for, uh, for joining us, Paolo. Um, Chair in Environmental Epidemiology um, within Imperial College London's School of Public Health. And um, now, Paolo. I've done a bit of research on you. You were born in the Barbara d'Alba beautiful wine region in Italy, yes. which is a beautiful region, but it's under threat, isn't it? Well, uh, in a, a way, yes, because uh, climate change is, uh, is uh, threatening uh, several areas in, in agriculture. And obviously, being born in this place, uh, which produces uh, a lot of very good wine, like uh, Barolo and Barbaresco, I'm, I'm concerned about, uh, well, the amount and the quality that, uh, of the wine that can be produced uh, in the future. Right, okay. Well, well thank you there for, for again, uh, Paolo, you have, you know, from your, your background and indeed your discipline, um, just so much to say on this panel, uh, which I hope we're all going to hear. Just to double check, did you all hear that okay in the audience? Okay, just sounded a bit quiet up here on stage, but if you, if you can hear Paolo, it's all good. Um, if it goes wrong, let me know. Um, but it's, Good stuff. Um, also, I'm really, really glad to say that we have um, Dr. Anna uh, Claudia Arujo, uh, or Arujo uh, on stage. Or should I say Arujo? Uh, Arujo, is that Yeah, Arujo is a, a Spanish uh, pronunciation. Yes. It's okay. okay. It's okay for me. So it's, it is with the J, isn't it? The Arujo. Yeah, yeah. It's the Araujo. Portuguese yeah. pronunciation. Um, who is a researcher in plant taxonomy um, and works on plants conservation in the Plants Under Pressure programme also at the Natural History Museum, so the NHM is out in force here today. Um, and um, you, you, you haven't just looked all this stuff up in a whole load of botany books, have you, um, Anna? Because you, you come from a, a farming background in Brazil. Yes, my grandfather from my mum's side, he used to uh, cultivate the land, although he did own the farm, but he was a farmer his entire life. Yeah. And um, also, well, you talk later about um, my childhood in a, a countryside village in an island yes. that uh, you cultivate sometimes in the garden as well. Yeah, excellent. Sometimes rice, sometimes beans, sometimes you have sugar cane as well in the back garden. Mm. So you've grown up with food and indeed growing yeah. food. Yes. Um, what is your favourite food, just out of interest? Um, I love bakes. I, I don't <laughs> eat as much as I wanted because uh, I need to be healthy, but uh, I love cakes, I love bakeries. I have, I like a dog in front of a sausage place, and you know, I just have to be turned around from a window of a bakery. Wow, Love it. okay. Awesome. So there we are. Our panel have um, laid out their credentials and got us thinking about food as well. Um, and so really, I, I suppose what we're all hoping to find as we're here today is, is your advice and your thoughts about um, how we can eat greener to help the planet. So maybe we could just start that on, on that uh, basis. And maybe I could go around to each of you and just one thing that springs to mind, just one thing that maybe all of us can start doing when we leave here today, if we're not doing it already, to help the planet. So, um, Neil, let me put you on the spot first then. Just what, what's one thing I, I can do just to be kinder to the planet with my diet? Um... Well, it's putting me on the spot. Yes, you, can look, you can look for fair trade products in the supermarket. Yeah. You can look for free range eggs if you, if you eat eggs. Most eggs are these days. I think over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen a number of examples of really good um, changes in, in public behaviour. I remember when free range eggs were by far the minority and, and most were battery farmed. But now these days in the supermarket, most of them will be free range. Right. And that's been driven by consumer choice. So what you buy in the supermarket really does affect uh, what the supermarket will stock. Okay, so be aware of what you're buying and look out for fair trade. Would be. Uh, and also you can try and buy seasonally, you can try and grow crop, buy crops that you think would have been grown in this country. If you're there in the shop, it should say on the label where it, which country it comes from. Yeah. So. Um, and one thing I've, I've become more aware of is food miles. So I do now check the packaging and I will not buy apples from South Africa. For instance, you, you know, if, we get them from Kent. Why am I buying if, them from South Africa? If you, if you want to have strawberries at Christmas, you can go into a supermarket and buy strawberries at Christmas. But if you want British strawberries grown in the summer, then mm. yeah. if, you, if you 
if you restrict yourself to the summer months, then you're more likely to get food that is grown okay. more locally and have, has a lot of food. Markets. Okay, so local. And so obviously we're using up lots of things that you might have said, Anna, but do you have anything to add to that? Just advice about, you know, uh, eating. Uh, in my view, the, the issue of eating healthily and helping the planet is bas basically involved in what you eat, as Neil put it, how much you eat of it mm -hmm. as well, and the package that it, it comes with it. So uh, it's kind of a battle that I, everyone faces is uh, buying food that is not packaged in plastic, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently with COVID, many people start to get a bit afraid to just pick up fruits, food that is not packaged. But you, there is a way that you can now push the supermarkets and, and the industry packaging in a more fairly way for, the, for, the, for nature. But uh, healthy food is, is basically organic. I personally am vegetarian. I don't eat meat, but I would not put people off of their meat. It's how much they eat that can be yeah. an issue. Okay. Um, and what about you, um, Paolo Vines? Um, now, you're a professor of public health, so you're probably not going to recommend that we drink too much of the lovely wine from Barbara d'Alba, but, um, <laughs> but what can we do for our own health and indeed the planetary health? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are right in saying that I may have a kind of conf conflict of interest uh, after my statement before about... Uh, Wine, because wine uh, uh, is not good for your health, uh, at least in excess. In any case, uh, uh, what can we do? Uh, there is a lot we can do about uh, food and climate change. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we are increasingly aware of the relationships between uh, food and climate change. Um, people say that uh, up to 25% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are related to, to food production plus the transportation and the, the whole chain. And, but the, much of it uh, is related to meat. Um, as, you, as probably most uh, people know, uh, meat, uh, um, well, animal uh, breeding is related to uh, methane emissions and emissions of other uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and methane is uh, 25 times uh, more powerful as a uh, greenhouse gas compared to uh, CO2. So one of the first suggestions uh, is really to reduce uh, the, the intake of meat. And uh, if there is some time, I can show a, a slide later about uh, specific recommendations that uh, take uh, uh, the planetary health uh, into account uh, in addition to uh, people's health. Okay. And uh, do, do, Paolo, are there any um, conflicts from a public health point of view um, where maybe making the right environmental decision could have an adverse effect on our health. I, I, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. Most of the time I'm thinking of all the suggestions that uh, Neil made. They seem to make sense from a green perspective and indeed from a public health perspective. But are, but are there sometimes conflicts there trying to achieve both? Well, uh, in general, people believe that uh, by uh, changing diet, uh, you get uh, uh, dual benefits, uh, uh, both for health and the planet. But certainly, there might be um, uh, conflicts uh, or, and even uh, trade-offs uh, you, you have to realize. For example, the um, dietary recommendations I mentioned before, um, the so-called uh, uh, Eat Lancet uh, uh, guidelines, uh, um, are not necessarily um, uh, right for the elderly or for the, the children. Um, also, they, they may not be affordable. Affordability is a big issue because a, a dietary transition may not be easily uh, met uh, in terms of costs for, for the, the normal people. So uh, I agree that there may be uh, conflicts between uh, health uh, and, uh, and the planet uh, and other goals. Right, but can those conflicts be resolved? Just, just briefly, and then we'll move the topic on. But uh, you know, if there is a conflict, can it be overcome? Sorry. I... Yeah, sorry. So you mentioned that there can, in some cases, be conflicts between climate goals and public health goals. Are there solutions? 
Well, um, solutions are quite difficult, but uh, they are becoming a, a really a necessity. And I, I think that uh, um, nowadays we are in front of two potential strategies. Uh, one is uh, uh, just focused uh, on the energy transition and uh, the transition to uh, renewables, uh, which is uh, uh, what, for example, the International Energy Association uh, um, suggests. Mm. But many people like me, uh, coming from a public health uh, perspective, believe that uh, uh, another strategy might be uh, more uh, effective, uh, and, and this is based on a general uh, transformation of society, which includes food, uh, but it, it also includes uh, transportation, uh, housing, uh, and uh, other sectors uh, of life, uh, where uh, the dual benefits uh, are not only um, beneficial because uh, they improve human health, but also from an economic point of view. Mm. Uh, because improving human health, uh, you, uh, well, save lives, uh, you increase uh, productivity uh, in the economic sector. Uh, so people have started uh, making uh, uh, calculations about uh, the, uh, the economic gains that you can have uh, from mm. such a dual or co-benefit uh, policy. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder if it is a, an area of climate change mitigation that's really sort of making progress now in, in terms of, of food. Um, Anna, what about you? Because you, I'm very interested in your background, having grown up in Brazil, and you'll know very well about Brazil's very rich, but also in many ways very threatened biodiversity. You must have seen firsthand, I suppose, that conflict oh, yeah. between feeding people, but also maintaining the biodiversity of the beautiful land. It this is still, and it's still help, ha, uh, happening. Um, although I was trained as a plant taxonomist, my, my very first project that I got involved was actually on mangroves. And um, one thing that I have observed, as I said, I was living in an island uh, surrounded by Atlantic rainforest, but then you have sugarcane in the back garden because it just happened to be there. And um, do, throughout my childhood, what uh, happened is that more and more uh, the area of uh, Atlantic forest was taken by urbanization, but as well as, because of that, because it was a touristic place, um, the uh, vegetation that was threatened was mangroves. That was one ex example how scientists can actually help to keep you know, parts of the vegetation healthy. You start to study a mangrove and the area, I think there is a, even a picture of the northwest of the island somewhere, an image uh, in the, in, in, for us to show the, the place. You can, you can see that it uh, would be nice if it was on, but I'm not sure if they can show. Um, the area where we were studying is still um, healthy, the vegetation is still healthy, and um, the, the surrounding area from 20, 30 years ago, many of that natural vegetation has taken completely. But from that time, going through Brazil, sugarcane, coffee, cotton, and nowadays, soya is the major problem. Although, and I just said, I am vegetarian, and I love, actually, I do love soya as a means, as a substitute of means. And soya, you, uh, used as a meat substitute, is not an issue. The big issue of soya today destroying uh, natural vegetation in Brazil is because they produce quite a lot to feed cows. And then I just think, if you eat, if soya is transformed in cow meat, you can eat just the soya. And then you don't have the problem that Paolo just uh, mentioned about mitten. So, of course, I'm not saying that people should all stop to eat um, 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 cattle because the farmers here and elsewhere also have to make a leave. But I think you have to check how much do you eat for it. And if you, everything that you are, has been produced is being consumed because you also have a lot of um, um, so, so, Anna Claudia, are, are you saying that, that one problem leads to another then? So the, the, the produce to feed the cattle itself has exactly. uh, a destructive yeah. impact exactly. and it goes down the, the so. line, okay. And then we heard about the methane emissions exactly. from like cow farts, uh, people, yeah, yeah. Uh, which can cause uh, you know, very potent um, glow, um, greenhouse gas warming. Can I just add one thing? Please do, Anna Claudia, uh, yes. Uh, recently I saw there is a big problem now with climate change in Brazil, and not only there, in, in Mexico as well, with lack of water. And the politicians are aware, and now the politicians, that, you know, it's good that they are aware, and they want to make rules, and they try to convince the farmers that those rules are not against them, but in favor. 
because they carry on destroying the Amazon forest, the uh, air rivers, so the, 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 the monsoon in, in, across South America is already reducing, and the farmers don't have enough water to keep their crops. So stop to destroy the Atlantic forest is actually in the farmer's favor. Mm. Uh, that's one thing. And also linking with what Paolo said about the healthy food that can be actually against climate change, avocado is another problem. That now you see the results. I mean, I wonder if the, the link is in there that Mexico is suffering so much with lack of water because avocado plantation actually reduce capture of water, but actually the plant needs a lot of water. Oh, no. To produce. But I, I love guacamole. <laughs> so Am do I. I'm a bad person. Oh, no. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, Neil. And the, the, these, these issues are all interlinked, and it, become, it can be, be really difficult for individual people to make conscious decisions because you know, we're very aware right at the moment of these supply chain issues within the UK, but this is a global supply chain of commodities being shipped around the world. And Anna Claudia was talking about the Atlantic rainforest, and m most of that has been destroyed, 98% or so, um, within recorded history. And most of that was done for farms in, in Brazil because it's a good climate, it's a good quality soil, at least to, at least to begin with. And the, the main crop there was, was sugarcane, as, as Anna Claudia says. And, and this, this is going back to you know, two or 300 years, and Brazil was the epicenter of the world's sugarcane, and the same in uh, the Caribbean colonies that Britain had at that time. Uh, and people were shipped around the world to, to farm the sugarcane. <clears throat> but in many ways, the, the same issue is mirrored in palm oil these days. And I think that image is a palm oil plantation, probably in Southeast Asia, because that's where most palm oil comes from. And you'll find palm oil in almost any um, food product that if it says vegetable oil on the ingredients it doesn't specify which one it's probably palm oil it's in most cosmetics uh, huge areas of Southeast Asian rainforests have been cleared in the last few decades to grow palm oil in these plantations as, as you see them now it's not native to Southeast Asia originally the species came from West Africa yeah. but it's probably slightly better than some of the alternatives to, that could be used mm. So, yeah, so I suppose it's very difficult to find any sort of food or solution that is 100% good. You know, there will be balances, you know. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but uh, there can be unintended precise. consequences. Um, so, Neil, uh, 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 it's lovely to have a taxonomist here with us, especially one from the Natural History Museum, an institution I think we all identify so much uh, here on the Great Exhibition Road with... Um, with t taxonomy and, and specimens. So how does that help you in, in your research? How does, does it help you to help us and biodiversity having access to all these taxonomic species? Uh, as, as somebody once said to me, how do you stuff a plant? I'm not a taxidermist, I'm a taxonomist. And taxonomists are um, a group of very, usually very dedicated scientists who study the world's biodiversity. And the aim is to work out which species is which. What is it called? Where is it from? What's it related to? What uses might it have? And increasingly these days, with the current biodiversity crisis, we're also asking, is it threatened? Um, where, how is it threatened? In, you know, exactly where is it from? What could be done to preserve it? And um, a lot of this, in, so we, there's a lot of very basic information that we're still gathering, in many ways, in exactly the same way as um, people would have done 250 years ago. We, we still have a collection of dried plant specimens in the museum. There's a, I don't know if we can see the slide, but there's a slide showing the collections behind the scenes. So if those of you who know the museum, if you walk through towards the, uh, the west end of the, the museum, past the dinosaur gallery, there we go, past the dinosaur gallery, and you see the cocoon, the top two images are inside the cocoon. So on, on uh, the top left is the historic collection where specimens were actually mounted in those large bound volumes, the books. Um, this goes back to um, medieval monks originally um, doing this, but a lot of those collections that we have in the museum are, are from, the, from the 17th century and the 18th century. And then um, the one on the top right is uh, an image of inside the main plant collection, and, and there are several million specimens in the museum collected from all over the world, and as you see, bound on sheets. And they have recorded location and habitat information. They, it says who collected it, when it was collected, and where it was collected. 
and we can use that to piece together um, a picture of the distribution of each species and then use that information to work out why they might be threatened, which is the work that, that we do on a, on a daily basis. And we are still collecting specimens like that. We've been um, on field trips ourselves in many parts of Africa, collecting in exactly the same way that Linnaeus himself would have done 250 years earlier. And if you go, if you know the Royal Academy in uh, Piccadilly, if, as you walk into the Royal Academy, you've got the two buildings flanking it on either side. Burlington House there still um, houses Linnaeus's collection of plant specimens, and they would look exactly in this, you know, the same manner as that, perhaps not quite so nice, but so yeah, nice. Yeah, okay. And, and, I, and I see all that, and I think it's absolutely gorgeous, because I thought maybe you're going to say, oh, we don't do that anymore, it's all satellites and drones these days, and clearly yeah. it's far from it. But, well, but tell us how that's helping the, the planet, though. So I, I really get it, and I love the taxonomy, and I love seeing these images, but how is that helping us tackle, really, the topic of today, really, about... It's exactly that, actually. It's the, it's the combination of the historical information from the specimens with the modern satellite imagery that shows us what is happening on the ground. And if we can find out exactly where the specimen was collected, and we have that for multiple specimens for a particular species, then we can, we can look um, literally on Google Earth, for example, mm. and see what the, the situation actually is right there on the ground at that time. And we use that information to then apply the IUCN Red List criteria to species and we do um, assessment of species after species after species of plants in our case, but other people do similar. Yeah, so, okay, so it was, you mean so it gives you an idea of how um, species have you know, like propagated through the years, is it? You know, how biodiversity has changed. But again, how's that helping with, with planetary health and food health? Well, for example, you, we, we might see that uh, a specimen collected only 30 years ago would have very precise coordinates that place it now in the middle of what is, what is clearly a, an oil palm plantation. Oh, I see. Okay. So it, does, it gives you that direct evidence. So, and we can yeah. measure the reduction in range. We can measure how much of the range is, is remaining, how much has been lost. We can see when the specimens were collected in different places. Right. And we're doing this literally for thousands of species across the world. And uh, our results show that about one in, in four plant species are threatened with extinction. Okay, so, so deforestation and other means, yeah. palm oil plantations, in the pursuit of feeding the world, are having this impact on habitat. And, and not necessarily large-scale industrial plantations like this, but just small-scale subsistence agriculture, the people of the world trying to feed themselves and their families. Right. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to come to, back to Paolo in just, just a, a moment or two to ask a little bit about the relationship between the pandemic, I suppose, and our food supplies and the implications of that. Um, now, let's, let's go to some audience questions from home. Oh, look, there aren't any. Folks, if you're watching this at home, please take part. Um, just put your question in the chat, and uh, it'll end up on, on the iPad. So do take your chance. Um, otherwise, you'll all start doing this with five minutes to go, and we'll just run out of time to answer your questions. So let's get some questions on the iPad. But what about here in the audience? Questions from the audience to come up to the microphone of power here. Um, any so far? Because, again, you'll all rush. It'll be a big rush towards the end. I guarantee we'll have ten hands up at five minutes to go, and then I'll be panicking. So any, does any, any early adopters? Brilliant, sir. Yeah, uh, hand up here. So just pop up to the mic. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, you could introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Uh, yeah, just, just lift it up. Yeah, it's, it's, you can just adjust the stand. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, hi there, I'm Oliver. I'm from Dame Madison School. I'm a student. And I was wondering, um, with the growing population, uh, and even with a shift to uh, more plant-based foods, is it still possible to grow sufficient food uh, for our population uh, without this huge deforestation that is causing this loss of biodiversity and land? Right. Yeah, so Oliver's question <laughs> kind of is, is deforestation <coughs> inevitable? Either, or, either that or we all go hungry, I think is asking yeah. Yeah. all of us. Great I, question. I think there is an image there, and that I am, I'm so delighted that you have asked that question. Because if that image can be shown of how much our food is food wasted, wa is wasted I would love if, if they it. could find the image. We, uh, and that is, I think that the image has, it's, it's amazing the quantity of food that has been uh, wasted uh, recently. There is information from actually this year from, from UK Daily waste, I, I don't have the number in the top of my mind, but it's in tons, while 
I think 9 million people across the world goes hungry. So as I said in the beginning, <clears throat> you have to eat. But are you eating what you need because you need? Or, you know, if, as I say, I have to, 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 to control myself because if I see a bakery, I want to try every single cake that is in there that looks nice. But I don't do it. And one reason I don't do it is because recently I realized that I am pre-diabetic. So, oh, hello, I have to go to this far, this far in my health to realize that too much sugar is bad for me. And I knew that was bad for the, the environment, but I couldn't resist. Now I can. So it's an exercise. It's what you are eating. You do, do eat three times a day because you really need and you eat the quantity that you really need because you really need it. Or you just eat because you are having a drink and then you, you know, stuff ourselves with crisps because it's nice, it tastes good, and etc. So it's that mindful, you know, to be mindful about what we eat. You, won't, you are not going hungry, but if you are wasting, you are wasting a lot, then you don't need that, many, that much area destroyed to grow in food. But going back what I just said before, in Brazil they are realizing that actually, Destroying the Amazon to plant food, to, to grow food, is not working because the, the seeds that they are planting is not developing, is not really, they are not harvesting the crop because there is not water there. And the, the, the pump of water comes from the forest. Mm -hmm. So you have to find, the word for me that uh, I would love everyone to live here today is the balance. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not stopping to, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not stopping to eat cake. I don't do, I just don't eat cake every day. Cake now is really a treat. Right, balance and, and moderation. So, yeah. so it, it, a kind of yes or no answer then. So um, uh, maintaining planetary health and safeguarding the future for our grandchildren is not kind of exclusive. It's not different from, it doesn't have to be um, compromised in order for us all to eat today. Yes. So it, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, so, uh, uh, Paolo, I wonder if I can come back to you online. And because um, I've I've heard, for instance, the um, the pursuit of and the manufacture of food has increased the likelihood of pandemics, maybe even like the COVID one that we're living through at the moment. So, how is that happening? Yes. Um, well. Uh, it is happening. Let's say that we are trying to reconstruct the, the causal chain, but it is uh, rather obvious that uh, deforestation and the increasing relationships between uh, humans and uh, the wilderness, uh, we, we all know the story of, of bats, uh, this uh, uh, increasing ex exploitation of, of the forest uh, for the reasons we, uh, we were saying before, uh, like uh, uh, growing uh, uh, food for animals, uh, this uh, uh, facilitates uh, the um, proliferation, uh, the, the, um, uh, the fact that uh, viruses like uh, coronaviruses uh, are uh, transferred, uh, transmitted from uh, bats uh, to wild animals and from wild animals uh, to, to humans. Um, in addition to deforestation, there is another issue, which is uh, uh, animal breeding, extensive uh, animal breeding, because uh, uh, these animals, which are uh, very often are genetically homogeneous, uh, may become uh, reservoirs uh, of viruses. Uh, we know that uh, um, the usual flu comes from, uh, uh, from farms, uh, and also uh, the bred animals ten tend to be, um, as I said, reservoirs of, of viruses. So there are, there are links uh, uh, pretty clear and uh, we can think of uh, uh, potential solutions. Uh, one is probably, uh, well, more than probably, uh, I, I'm sure about that. We, we have to reduce uh, our intake uh, of what is called uh, ultra-processed food, in addition to, uh, to meat. Meat is, is certainly a priority. Uh, but in, in, on top of meat, uh, um, there has been an increasing production and intake uh, of uh, ultra-processed food, that is industrial foods, uh, uh, which are um, uh, very rich in calories, uh, uh, sugar, uh, fats, uh, uh, and so on. Um, these are very profitable for the industry, uh, and, but they have a, a negative impact uh, on both health uh, and the planet. Uh, we have shown in our own research uh, at the School of Public Health that uh, ultra-processed food uh, 
is related to uh, obesity in adults uh, and children, uh, is related to cardiovascular diseases, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, but they also have a, 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 a quite important uh, footprint uh, uh, on the planet. Uh, for the same reasons we were saying before uh, about uh, monoculture, for example. Um, well, I have myself a, a question uh, for the two other members of the panel, which is uh, uh, what uh, do you know about uh, regenerative agriculture? Uh, that is uh, the fact that uh, agriculture can be a um, carbon sink. Uh, I know some experiences like uh, coffee plantations, but I, I wonder whether you have a uh, additional suggestions. Right, so panel. So we've had this question from Paolo Vines, who's actually <laughs> on our panel, who's asking a great question actually, Paolo, about regenerative agriculture. Uh, I'm going to take a, a usual scientist cop out and say that's <laughs> not my field. Um, but I, I think it, um, it does seem to hold a lot of promise. I, I don't know too much about it personally, but I have um, read uh, of a number of examples within the UK. In fact, Anna Claudia is reviewing a book for the museum magazine that uh, fe features the, the shepherd in the in the Lake District who's doing this on his own farm. Um, I, I think it does have a lot of promise. There are grants in the UK, I know, uh, for farmers to plant trees on their land, which is not quite the same thing, but yeah. uh, more of a balance between... Okay. Um, different sure. crops in different areas. And actually, I've just, just realised, uh, I don't quite know what regenerative agriculture is. I kind of asked it as if I know what it means. And I'm, I've been sitting here thinking, does, does it just mean you, you, you must regenerate then? But, um, <laughs> it, it, it's farming in a way that um, adds nutrients back into right. the soil rather than relying on external uh, sources of nutrients like, uh, like uh, fertilizers. And so I see, so it's a practice of, of farming that... It's, 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 it's more in tune with um, pre-industrial farming, um, think what the way things would have been done 100 or 200 years ago, rotating livestock and crops around different fields to, yeah. over time, build up the, the health of the soil and the fertility of the soil. Wow, well, that was the opposite of a cop-out. That's actually a great answer. Did, did, Anna Claudia, do you have anything to, to um, add? I, th I think is one thing that I'd like to, to just clarify is that there are two initiatives that people always... You always put our hope in they are important. This is one of them, the regenerative agriculture, that also involves to leave large, oh, large areas of hedges. Then you can have the biodiversity in between plots of agriculture. And the other thing that has been done quite for quite a while is a seed collection. But what sometimes I worry is that people think, oh, great, then, then you have the solution. Then you can actually destroy everything because you have a, a seed bank on one side and you do the com you compromise with agric uh, regenerative agriculture. That's not the answer. I mean, it's good that what you have now as agriculture would have a different take. Mm -hmm. And it's good that you have a backup with seed collection. But you cannot go on destroying natural vegetation because you depend upon them okay. for as, as, even as a DNA resource for the diversity of the plants that actually are our sorry are our current crops. Mm. So there is a study in the Natural History Museum with Dr. Sandy Knapp exactly on that area. So try to find the sisters and cousins of potato, tomatoes, and check if there are genes there that can help us to have a better crop. So you need the wild varieties or other species, you know, they're out there. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And, and we, we are getting some questions from uh, people at home now. And this, this one, actually, I'm going to address to you, Paolo. Um, this is from uh, Aurore Pedia, um, uh, who says, I have become worried by the health impact of processed plant alternatives to meat. Um, do you have any information on this? Yeah, so processed plant alternatives... Uh, sorry, I cannot hear very well. Perhaps oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just repeat the question again. It's, um, so uh, Aurora basically is saying that she's uh, uh, worried about the um, health impact of processed plant alternatives to meat. So. Oh, you, well, I, I see what she means. Um, yeah, uh, she probably refers to the industrial production of meat uh, from... Uh, uh, cultures uh, of uh, tissues uh, in, in the laboratory on, a, on an industrial scale? Well, um, the, uh, the answer is quite difficult, I must say. 
and I, I do not have a, a, a clear opinion because on one side, if you like, it is a brilliant uh, uh, idea. It is feasible. Uh, and I, I heard a few presentations about that. Um, uh, and uh, it allows people who really love eat meat uh, uh, to, to, to uh, still uh, eat meat. Um, and the impact on, on the environment uh, is uh, extremely uh, low because there, there, there will be no production of methane. Or, well, there will be very limited production of, of methane uh, since uh, this meat uh, is uh, produced uh, essentially in a factory, you know, in a plant. Yeah. Um, I, I do not have uh, personally concerns from the health point of view, except that uh, whenever you simplify um, uh, diet, uh, usually you you miss something so uh, this is certainly a simplification because uh, uh, you can grow uh, in, in in the lab and in a factory uh, a, a, a kind of imitation of, of meat uh, you, you will not have the same all the, the same elements and ingredients so this is certainly something very very artificial right so and uh, yeah. whenever we have uh, uh, moved to to artificial uh, to, uh, food uh, we discovered that uh, uh, something was missing, like uh, micronutrients, uh, vitamins, and so on. So I, I have mixed feelings. Right, so okay, so not the full solution. But I do wonder if, if maybe what Aurora meant is more like processed plant foods. And I was reading, actually, that, that there are growing concerns about uh, plant-based diets based on foods that are processed so they are, they, they are strictly vegan products, so we might think that they're healthy because of that, but they're still processed food. And maybe you've already okay. answered the question when you were saying they could lack micronutrients and other aspects, but Aurora actually does finish the question by saying, what fake sausages are best? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that, Paolo? What, so, what kind of fake or artificial sausages are the best? Well, of course, I cannot answer this question, <laughs> but I can say that uh, in general, what we have learned uh, fr from nutrition is that uh, when things uh, are um, uh, artificial and simplified, uh, like a most uh, ultra-processed food, they are not good for, for health. Mm. They have implications that can be discovered uh, after uh, a long time. Uh, we shouldn't forget uh, that uh, um, what we know about uh, the, the relationships between health, uh, diet and health uh, comes after uh, decades of research in epidemiological studies. So I would be extremely prudent uh, in uh, introducing uh, plant or, or meat-based uh, mm -hmm. artificial um, substitutes. Right. Um, Perhaps Anna Claudia can can answer that as well because she is vegetarian, as she says, and has tried a whole variety of vegetarian sausages. And I don't know if you have a particular <laughs> favourite. But you can get some quite imaginative ones these days with beetroot and things. Well, <clears throat> sorry. Um, one thing that I do is uh, I use my, particularly now in the last two years, my part of my weekend to do the shopping online, and I spend a quite good amount of time checking the ingredients of every product. Like, say, say it, they are vegetarian, they are healthy, I want to know what is in it. And I have changed a few times, so I don't want to make the advertisement of any you know, maker of a sausage oil or any <laughs> other product. But um, if you go to the supermarket or online <clears throat> and get one product that you really like, and put, get all the makers, different makers, for instance, soup, carrot and coriander, and go to the label and check what's in there. You see the different makers, they have different ingredients. If there is carrot and coriander, of course, that is, but there are other things there. Why there are other things and why these other things have different quantities on it? For instance, one thing that I noticed is sugar. There are sugar in soup and different quantities. So if one maker can make with less sugar, why the other one opts to have with a lot of sugar? Mm. So I will go to the ingredients and I will check and I will see if I know what these products are. If there are a lot of the names that you don't understand what they are, they probably are not good for you. Yeah, so <laughs> things that are not carrot or coriander, <laughs> just beware, oh, yeah, okay. 
Uh, so um, <coughs> now we've had a great question from Holly, who is really saying, um, is this uh, tackling this about behaviour change, or really is this a policy question? Is this down to our policy makers and, uh, uh, and companies? I don't necessarily see that as a dichotomy. I think there's an interaction between both of those uh, alternatives. So I think uh, consumer change helps drive policy and policy helps drive con consumer change. Okay. I think it takes both. Yeah, right. I um, recently, I investigated also in my hometown, a species, a micro orchid that is critically endangered. So it's almost in, being extinct in the island. And uh, we went together to investigate that species and one local uh, actually, a group of biologists in the area, they are trying to preserve the central part of the area that is still a small remain of Atlantic forest, and that species should occur there. And they say, if you can find a species here and being critically endangered, then that will be the published that signed as a scientific paper, because then you have a backup to go to the politicians and say, this area has to be preserved because of that species. So we scientists, you also, when you study, you study what is important, what is, you, you know, you, you, that's what we do. Because you don't want to come to the point where, where a pol policymaker comes to us, but how do you know? Where is the data? Mm -hmm. So we provide that. So how do policymakers know what is best, what the population wants? What's better? Sometimes the population has to make the change or lead the change but based on their own choices. Yeah. And then this will lead, everything else happens. So don't wait for the policy makers. Yeah, no, sure. Um, would you look at the time? We, we've only got about 10 minutes to go. So you, this is your chance to fire up any questions, folks, here in the audience, or those of you at home. Um, yeah, okay. Um, but if, if you think, oh, yeah, great, it's lovely. Put your hand up. So, and uh, I mean, you put your hand up, you know what I mean. Head, head to the microphone. No singing, <coughs> but um, yeah, but you can give us your name yeah, if you want. Definitely not. Um, <laughs> it's uh, Sarah. I work at Imperial in like um, administrative support for research grants. Um, my question. I don't know really who to pose this to, um, but it's a bit about like um, the problem of like misinformation. So there's you know, a lot of media portrayal of science works on like clickbait or powerful headlines. Um, how do you think, like personally, is it best to like pick through those to find like the actions that is better, best to take, especially as things are like constantly emerging, like new information? And it's like what you said about the soya, like if you're looking at different plant milks, like, oh, well, soya it gets a bad reputation because it's destroying the rainforest. But then, you know, 80% of that is going to animal feed. So then people are drinking oat milk, which has like a really high water like, usage. So it's just, you know, how, how are we supposed to pick through that as individuals or, you know, help That's each other right. and stuff? Either of you. That's yeah. such, yeah, thanks, Are Sarah. You? Yeah, how, how, we, we need good BS detectors, don't we, basically? Yeah, I think um, that level of critical thought is, is really important. And I, th I think there's no harm in always questioning, is that true? How can I check that? Where, is there another study I can look at? I do think, I don't want to sound smug, but I do think a scientific training um, does come in really useful. And I think um, a lesson from the pandemic is, is suddenly people realise that actually scientists do know what they're talking about in m m most cases and they don't necessarily have an agenda they're not trying to um, steer conversation one way or another they they gather the data they analyze it they present the, the facts and then um, it's partly a question of consumer change and it's partly a question of policy making and it's partly a question of people um, seeking reliable sources of information personally i don't use social media so i can't really comment on that but one of the reasons I don't use social media is because I don't necessarily think it's very trustworthy. Mm. No, sure. But, but what if you're not a scientist? And I, I don't know, but probably quite a few people in this room and watching online are not scientists, and they might feel quite disheartened by what you've just said. Just any sort of tips, Anna Claudia, or you, Paolo, just about, uh, or you, Neil, uh, you know, just about the starting points, you know, just good resources. You no, know, go to a, maybe, if you want to look something up online, go to a university website, for instance, because it's more likely to be true than something on a dodgy media website. I think you have, uh, you gave, you gave to, to the public the, the right clue. I, I uh, anyone picks up something in the social, social media, 
can check the, you know, the information is out there. You go to uh, a software, you put that keyword, for instance, soya, there are loads of you know, information coming through. If you put, um, I'm not sure if I can say that, but, but for instance, Google Scholar, you just get publications on it. Mm. Oh, but then I won't, I really won't understand what those scientific publications say. I am happy to say that the Natural History Museum has, has actually a group of people in communication and public engagement. And sometimes if people have very particular questions, in the website, they can launch a question, and this will be driven to or sent to a scientist. Of course, we are up to our ears, you know, with this <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but, but research. Anna Claudia, if, if, I think if, if Sarah's, you know, you're in the supermarket wondering which kind of milk to buy, you know, to look up something on Google Scholar, then follow through to a scientist, yeah. email I know, them, I know, you know. I know. <laughs> She'll so be very it, hungry by the it, time it, she you leaves. Know, in, in practice, yeah. you, you make mistakes. You make mistakes, but eventually something, oh gosh, I just bought that, uh, Soy or something, I'm doing something wrong. Don't throw away because it's waste. You are not doing any better throwing it away. You bought it, mm. you have to eat it. Except yeah. if, of course, there is some poison, don't do it. But um, if you want to really to go through, follow through, follow, you know, and then you have here in this country a fantastic um, um, habit of book clubs. Why don't do scientific clubs? And then someone picks up a subject and people you know, mm -hmm. search different things. And you learn every week or once a month you meet up. It's a way to socialize and a way to learn something. And then you, know, tr and then you can realize, oh, for a long time I have been making a mistake. For instance, in my, in my case, eating avocado. <laughs> right, okay, you find those things out. So, um, so Paolo, uh, what about, you know, if I'm worried about a particular ingredient or some you know, public health measure that I'm thinking about, should I go to the Public Health England website or TikTok? Uh, what, what sources do you recommend? Well, uh, the, the, the answer is obvious that you should go to Public Health England. But I, I would like to say something more, uh, because I, I, was, I think that uh, COVID uh, was uh, uh, an experience that uh, we should learn from uh, um, as far as uh, climate change is, is uh, concerned, uh, from the point of view of communication because we have seen a lot of miscommunication about COVID. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, one solution is, I, well, I'm not uh, pretending it, it is a solution or, or the solution, but we need an alliance uh, uh, between uh, scientists, uh, uh, the media, and uh, uh, probably uh, pol politics uh, or policy making. Um, because uh, we have seen this uh, particular phenomenon of uh, echo chambers, uh, for example, the fact that uh, there are uh, small communities that, uh, or, or not, not so small communities, uh, that uh, communicate uh, uh, within themselves uh, and are very uh, reluctant to accept uh, a discussion with, with other people and to accept uh, uh, um, suggestions from, uh, from science in particular. There is a, a big confusion between facts, opinions, uh, theories, uh, hypotheses, uh, and so on. So, I, I see an alliance uh, also with uh, the schooling system, and we, we need uh, all of that because uh, uh, a lot of damage has been uh, already done by TikTok and, uh, and other social media. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's really helpful. And um, oh, and we have a question at the back. So, yeah, if you're happy to come over to the mic, that's brilliant. And thank you for that, by the way, um, Paolo. And just as a, a science communication lecturer, one thing I'd say is um, there, there are quite a few fact checking websites now as well. Um, so, and full fact, for instance. So, don't go to full fact. Um, you may get the bit, you know, full fact. So, there are resources to get reliable information. But I think Sarah's asked such a massive question there. I'm glad we've given that a few minutes. I think it really matters. Right. Yeah, go for it. It's a bit tall, isn't it? You can angle it down. Can you can give us your name if you fancy, but you don't have to. Hi. Um, my name is Nuria, so I'm from University College School. Um, I've come across an app for the average consumer uh, which can scan um, like normal, uh, normal products at the supermarkets. The app is called Geeky. Um, okay. And uh, it has, like, if you, you can scan certain products, and it, it has certain badges on it, um, like to do with um, how green it is, how healthy it is, how socially fair it is. Um, although I'm not completely sure how accurate it is, like scientifically accurate, but I think it's very, it has a lot of potential um, 
for yeah. for human and planetary health. Um, and I wanted to know if um, how much potential it actually has if it were to to be from a fully scientific um, place, like if it were from a Imperial College or something, they they had their own app, sort of like Geeky, or worked with with apps like Geeky for the average consumer to be able to quickly scan any sort of product they see at the supermarket and be able to make their decisions based on that. Okay, Thanks. great. And it's, it's Nuri, is it? You said your Nurea. name? Nurea. Nurea. Okay, yes. thank you, Nurea, for that question. Um, so, uh, gosh, I, th I think that's a really good question because we kind of all want something. Sarah does. I know I do as well. That you just, you know, you've got your phone, you just scan a barcode at the supermarket, and then it'll just take you to a resource that will tell you how green it is. But then I think um, Nurea's question is, but how do we know we can trust that? Um, that's a really open, a thing. further research, I suppose, reading reviews, seeing if it's had good reviews from academics or trustworthy people. But it's, a, it's such a good question, though, isn't it? How do you know? I, I haven't heard about that particular app, um, although I'll, I'll keep an eye out for, yeah. for, for news about it. But I did read something just the other day about, in, um, I think we're all familiar with the traffic light system that you get on most food packaging these days, saying how much salt or fat or... Um, sugar. sugar, yeah, that mm. is contained in different products, and there was, uh, there is apparently um, an initiative, and major food companies are already involved in in trying to promote this, in uh, adapting a kind of um, environmental uh, traffic light system, so that you have some oh. some information on the packaging to let you make an informed choice that. about what you should buy. That. But I, I think. As a general principle, and I think this applies in life in, in, in general, remain curious, check, mm. ask, where is this from? Uh, what can I do about it? How can I find out more about it? And you know, with the internet these days, it's amazing the amount. There are, as, as Scara says, there are some um, websites which are very reliable and, and in terms of biodiversity. An enormous amount is just on Wikipedia these days. Mm, excellent. OK. So we're going to have to leave it quite soon. So I think, actually, final question to you, Neil, because I did want to talk about COP just quickly and what hopes you have of biodiversity, um, especially when it comes to plant species, being on the agenda at COP and leading to good outcomes in terms of this, this whole debate about our food production. Uh, well, uh, the first thing to say probably is... is there are several COPs. The COP means the Conference of the Parties. They are um, instruments of UN conventions. The convention is a continuously evolving body of legislation that all, um, all countries that are members of the United Nations uh, can sign up to. The Biodiversity Convention, which was signed in Rio in 1992, has almost every country in the world, with some notable exceptions. I won't mention the US, but I just did. Um, <laughs> the US. <laughs> Uh, the, the COP that we're getting in, uh, a lot of news about in this country is the Climate COP, which is coming up in Glasgow next month. Um, that tackles the UN Climate Convention. The Biodiversity COP will be partly this autumn, um, also next year in China. It's actually been postponed twice already because of the pandemic. And the way the COPs work is that they endorse um, future target ac targeted actions. And this one is particularly important because it should have been in 2020 and it should have reviewed targets that were set in 2010 that should have been met by 2020. None of them were met. But there's a new initiative now in what should have been 2020 to set new targets for 2030. And you might have seen uh, coming out of the G G7, one of the announcements was a move for countries to set aside 30% of their land to, for pr protection of biodiversity by 2030. And there's a lot of wiggle room in that, but um, that is something that will hopefully get endorsed when the, when the biodiversity COP finally meets in China next year. Okay. So I do remain optimistic than that. Oh, brilliant. Oh, moving in the right direction. Oh, we finished on an optimistic note. Thank goodness. That's, that's what I was hoping for. I mean, it's the problems ahead and we can't be naive about it, but optimism breaking out, I think, there from Neil and Anna Claudia is nodding as well. Um, look, we're going to have to leave it. Just before you go, I'm going to thank you and the panellists presently, very shortly, but um, we would love some feedback from you, if you don't mind. That would be very nice. What did we do well? What didn't, you know, 
great panel, shame about the host, anything like that, or just, I'm hungry, you could write that. That's not very helpful, actually. But anyway, you get the idea. So you can see you've got a URL to go to, um, head to that QR code as well. And uh, yeah, honestly, we, we, especially we haven't done this for a couple of years, obviously, but with everything. So just let us know what you thought. Um, and at home, there is a link coming up in your chat for your um, feedback at home, and you have the chance to win a £50 voucher. Now, that's not bad with the inflationary pressures that we face. We need all the money that we can get. Um, so, huge apologies if I missed your question. And um, at home or here in the audience, if you loved it so much, you want to go through it all again, guess what? It's been recorded in really good quality as well. So you just um, go to our website, greatexhibitionroadfestival.co.uk. I get paid £10 for every time I say that, uh, which will be a lot today. But anyway, you go to our website and um, play back the recording or other panels that you missed um, or recommend it to your friends. And, um, and of course, it's not just this panel. Don't just walk out and forget about us. There's other events going on during this week. So check that website and um, go to more stuff. Come and support us. We'd really, uh, really, really like that. Um, uh, also, um, big thank yous, uh, I'll thank the panel in a minute, but uh, Emma, Dan and um, Jennifer, who's um, uh, uh, working behind the scenes, but also we've got the uh, brilliant sort of technical crew who you don't see, but they've done an amazing job of rigging this stage and getting the sound going and dealing with the online stuff as well. They make it look easy, but there's a load of stuff to go wrong and they just get it right every time. They've absolutely nailed it. So huge thanks to them. Um, and of course, to our, to our speakers, to, um, to Paolo, to Anna Claudia, and Neil, but as you embark on a gentle round of applause that will accelerate and, and just get even greater as it goes along, give the biggest round of applause to yourself for coming out here and supporting this event. And I applaud you as well. I'm Gareth Mitchell saying have a lovely day.